My mother-in-law sent a lovely note to my mother regarding a loss in the family. And man, the whole thing was written in impeccable cursive. <laughs> and then I was journaling the next day going, oh, geez, like somewhere around eighth grade, they were like, you know, you can just print for the rest of your life if you want. Which says something about, I guess, my handwriting skills. But Yeah, my, my first grade teacher, I think it was first grade, maybe third grade. I don't know. I had a teacher, I feel like I remember this meeting where they're like, um, I'm really worried that your son, this is a parent-teacher meeting, really worried your son's going to have just horrible handwriting. And I remember thinking, well, hey, I'm in first grade. How can you know that? And I'm offended. So there's no way that's going to happen. And I know we're just, this is just audio, but if you could see my handwriting now, you would know that she is a, some kind of a prophet future seeing my writing is horrible. It's sort of cursive. Um, it's, it's awful. And so like my kids are starting to, you know, they're all sort of learning cursive and I think it's, uh, it's a lost art. Hey everybody, this is the Data Driven Marketer sponsored by NetWise. I'm Adam. I'm Brian. I'm Matt. Welcome back for another Hang in the Data Basement. Thank you for joining us. And special thanks to our guest this week, Matt Heinz, who is the president of Heinz Marketing, author and host of another podcast, Sales Pipeline Radio, which I realized I didn't confess that uh, beforehand that I also listened to. So Awesome. Uh, cool. We have another host who does the podcast occasionally, has a really specific thing he wants to talk to you about sometime, which I don't <laughs> want to ruin it for him, but we'll have to have you come back to talk about uh, the ROI on Google search ads. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> He's been yeah. in your comments fighting with some people lately. <laughs> That's sticky wicked. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. Otherwise, I'll uh, go ahead and throw to, throw to you, Matt, for a little bit of your your background for the listener. Yeah, no, appreciate. It. I am also recording this from my basement. Uh, this little <laughs> corner of our uh, our built there, our dug in basement has become a comfortable place the last year and a half. Um, and uh, yeah, my name is Matt Hines. Started a company called Hines Marketing about thirteen years ago. We're you know in bar speak, we help companies sell their stuff. Uh, we help companies organize a marketing driven, revenue responsible approach to you know uh, driving velocity, predictability, and scalability of new pipeline and close business and complex selling situations. And like you said, we just, you know, I'm a, I'm a journalist by trade. So, you know, when I started the business, didn't have money for marketing. We've just been doing content for forever. So got a blog, got the podcast, been doing some video series on LinkedIn, written a couple books and um, yeah, just kind of having fun with it. Very cool. We also met ultimately. Well, we met for the first time right before we started recording this, but we have crossed paths in another community <laughs> where you're kind of the ringleader of keeping the thing going, which I don't talk too much about, but I really enjoy it. Good. Uh, so that's a rabbit hole we could for sure chase, just talking about community in general and how it's sort of distinct from all this stuff. But I think mm -hmm. what we're all more stoked to talk about this time is the relationship between the sales and marketing departments, ultimately. Yeah, I think, well, I think maybe the first thing to call out is for, for me and Brian, our context is in B2B. So yeah. everything is in a way amplified sometimes compared to uh, what you might have it for sales and marketing at a, like a consumer goods company or something. Um, also, I well, guess our we're stuff, talking about the digital space, right? So Yeah, and, and I think you could argue that you know, consumer marketers, I would argue in many cases, are far more advanced. Um, I think their use of analytics, their use of data, um, their use of intent signals. I mean, and this isn't new. This is stuff they've been doing forever, right? So I think it's far more interesting in most cases. Um, I also, but I think we're starting to catch up a little bit. I think that, you know, the data we have available to us as sellers, um, our ability to create a seamless experience digitally and offline um, with the data that we have across not just sales and marketing, but customer success and account management and anybody in your organization that's building value and communicating with your um, with your prospects and customers. Um, so we're getting better. And I think some of that is about the data. Some of that is about sort of the, just the just hand-to-hand the -hand tactical coordination between these groups as well. Yeah, you touch on a piece that's uh, that's core to me. And I, I mentioned this when we were chatting ahead of time, but it's rare that I have a guest where I'm like, adamant that a specific topic would like help today with work i'm doing right so you, you mentioned customer success all these other teams uh that really come into play with 
uh, the idea of marketing these days, right? Because the concept, it's almost the term I feel like is is being redefined to be more expansive, right? It's it's uh, Adam's role is actually comms when we hired him. And marketing, in my mind, is kind of a piece of the comms, right? It's part of how we're communicating. All these teams drive value, like you said. And how that becomes coordinated how those teams collaborate where they overlap how you hand off especially in a, in a like a data-driven situation where you have software and systems and processes and and, and uh data decisions database decisions how does that how do you coordinate all of that right it's not just the old school sales closes them marketing brings them in sales close them um there's so much more it's not subtle strictly things. a relay anymore yeah I, i've described it before as like a relay and it's not really it's kind of like but then we also have to run together for three laps and then at the very end i'll hand it off to you for one last lap you hold the baton <laughs> together for a lap <laughs> right <laughs> awkward <laughs> yeah i think um it's definitely more of a team sport you know, than, than an individual sport. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a team sport where you have to play together. I mean, you can say like a relay race, you know, everyone's working together, but everyone has their segments and there's a very clear handoff. Um, I don't think we work like that in B2B anymore. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. I think you, know, you used to think about, again, no one can see this as I hold my hands up. We used to think about the funnel as sort of split horizontally between sales and marketing, right? Marketing owns the top sales owns the bottom. There's a handoff of a lead or whatever. And we're done. I think now that that funnel is really split far more vertically. Where, you know, in those complex selling situations, like sales gets involved earlier, marketing mm -hmm. is involved far later in the mm -hmm. deal. You know, I think in, I've seen some organizations where marketing is spending far less time, budget and resources on demand generation and far more on sales enablement because of the maturity of their market or the mature or the, the size of their pipeline and addressable market. So I think that collaboration is required now in most organizations we're working with. It is, let's not pretend it's easy. Let's not pretend it's easy to define, let alone operationalize, <laughs> but it very much is sort of that, you know, one plus one equals three situation to get greater yield velocity and predictability out of your sales efforts. How do you start to evaluate that at an organization? How do you identify what the groups are and how they hand off and where they overlap? There's, there's so much... I find there's so much customization based on how the company thinks about themselves and then mm -hmm. actually how they actually do things and then mm -hmm. what software they use and systems and then even just the individuals. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've, we've sort of, when we, when we talk to a new company and sort of try to assess the level of sales and marketing integration that they currently have, we ask for to see a couple examples of things. We ask to see, uh, you know, what, what is, you know, please show us your defined ICP ideal customer profile mm -hmm. and how you guys have defined and documented sort of the buying committee and the buying journey associated with that. And then sh you send us whatever is documented around the sales playbook. Like how do you engage with people, um, you know, across that, especially the beginning part of that process, whether they have or don't have those documents is telling <laughs> what's in those documents is also telling. Um, well, here's our version, but sales has their own version that is telling as well. Right. <laughs> so you can assess a certain level of sort of how well in sales and marketing integration has been operationalized. Um, and I'm sure you guys have never heard this before, like where you say like, Hey, tell me, you know, show, can you send me your ICP, send me your ideal customer for definition? So, well, I don't have it, but let me tell you to you. I'll say, if you don't have it written down, I know this sounds parochial, but if you don't have it written down, I guarantee you it is being interpreted differently <laughs> across your organization. So yep. yeah, we, we really do need to write it down. Someone needs to complain that it's inaccurate and then we can figure, we can resolve all that. Totally. You know, but this is this is where it's like marketing says, oh, these are good leads and sales says they're not. Well, this comes down to definitions, my friends, like if like it, it, either 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 marketing is generating too much crap or sales isn't willing to sell to people that may need a little, you know, sort of status quo changing. But like you've got a problem there fundamentally that isn't going to go away unless you, unless you do the work. Yeah, in marketing, I spend a lot of time currently asking sales, but why is it bad? And then trying to build systems so they can do that without me having to ask why it's bad. Um, well, there's an interesting aspect of that that we talk about often. And I think it's why we sometimes present it as like what's happening out in the, out in the market is ultimately that marketing is eating sales. Um, I think that's not the most generous way to put it. Like we really should say it's like crossbreeding with sales or something to make it sound... <laughs> 
honestly sexier. <laughs> uh, or just weird. But, or just weird. Yeah. <laughs> what part of what you're talking about is ultimately like this piece of sales may be good at de- defining that customer profile, but they're not good to, uh, they're not necessarily as good at applying it to the storytelling piece. So it ends up being marketing who comes in and goes, we need to get all of, we need to all understand the same story of who we're selling to here. And that's kind of the underlying exercise with, you know, an ICP, yeah, you know, uh, sprint or whatever you want to call it. Right. Yeah. So a lot of times it's marketing just going, I, yeah, tell that to me again, but you know, so I can understand (laughs) it and then eventually going, okay, this is the one in the middle. Everybody stop yeah, making up and, new and ones. I, and I think that, you know, you have, if, if we think of it as sort of marketing eating sales, that, that this isn't someone wins and someone loses. Like we all win and we all lose together. You know, if, mm-hmm. if sales misses their number, then by definition, marketing wasn't successful either. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and this gets even more complicated in, in a, in a product led growth company where you've got, you know, you're doing either snackable starters or freemium or free trials. And sort of now you have to sort of take this buying journey that hopefully marketing is championing and defining and sort of creating integration between product marketing, sales, account management. I mean, this, this, your, your, your coordination problem gets exponentially harder. But if you can figure out components of that, you're doing really well. I want to point out one other thing, though, is for people listening to this and think, oh, shit, this is a really high mountain I got to climb. Um, ultimately, yes, it is. But uh, <laughs> there was some data on this, a company called Demand Metric did some research a couple of years ago, and they looked at the correlation between integration of sales and marketing systems and the likelihood of those companies hitting their revenue targets. And they found a direct correlation between the increased sophistication and alignment of sales and marketing systems and a higher likelihood of hitting their revenue targets, right? But what's interesting wasn't just that correlation, it was the data set. So they, the way that the, 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 the data they looked at wasn't just um, no integration to minimal integration to moderate integration to advanced. It went from no integration to ineffective integration to minimal, moderate, and advanced. And it was still an up and to the right directly. So what that data tells me is that if you buy into all of this, we need to get the well-defined ICP. We need to make sure we all agree on who we're selling to. If you start from nothing and, and then go to doing a shitty job, you're still moving forward. Hmm. You are still by trying to do this and failing yeah. and then fixing it. You're still going to see better results. The, yeah, it's very, it's it. Uh, first coming with the data set is speaking our language around here. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's very, like my journey into marketing was through the arts. Um, like a lot of people, it's the arts and crafts. That mm-hmm. was me all the way. I went to film school. <laughs> like, so I'm sure you've heard the phrase, the obstacle is the way there's a whole book kind of about that thinking, but you, in, in art school, you do a lot of like, they call them obstruction exercises where the point is like, tell the same story three ways. Here are the limitations for each way. And one of them will be like, you're not allowed to move the camera. One of them is like, you're not allowed to edit one of you know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It, just the exercise of trying to coordinate this stuff yeah. it sounds from that data set makes people better so it doesn't even matter mm-hmm. if you don't find the right tools or the right software or whatever the fact of the interdepartmental like conversation it forces is yep. is a value prop alone yep i we That's have we talked to a lot of companies that are really stressing about having full data to full attribution data of their complex deals right and they're like i'm sure i'm missing something i'm sure of course you're missing something you will always be missing something you will never and sometime 10 years from now when robots are selling to robots someone's going to prove me wrong if they hear this (laughs) podcast but like i just don't think you're ever going to have full attribution of everything yeah so it's not about the report it's about the intent Right. Mm -hmm. Like knowing that like your white paper download didn't generate the eight figure deal, knowing that the booth scan from five years ago shouldn't be given full credit for closing the deal. Now, I mean, knowing that there's a body of work in the middle there that's got to work, knowing that you can't look at individual channels and assign a really valuable cost per lead. I don't care about cost per lead. I care about cost per opportunity. I care about cost per close one. I want to know what I'm willing to spend and then work back to get to the body of work to get there. And am I going to be able to measure and attribute all of it? No, but you ha- in a complex selling environment, you have to think about it as a body of work versus individual components of a campaign. I love how I you spend a that. lot of time in meetings, stressing the idea of even within data, like, look, even if you want to keep it data science sort of linguistically or, or methodologically or whatever, like there is margin of error. 
And in our world of marketing in particular, it's just going to be squishier than most people would like. And so even as you go through these conversations, sometimes you have to go to sales and say, yeah, but that number is like 20% squishy. So if we go from 100 to 80, don't get worried yet. A lot of times they see that and go, that's 20% less leads. That's especially relevant (laughs) for B2B marketers, right? And this has come up on previous episodes, but... B2B is inherently more complex. There's more people on both sides. There are more steps. There's more information. Consumer marketing, in some cases, when it's really simple, right, you can get statistical significance. You can really, truly like run, you can operationalize a digital funnel and have like numbers make some of the decisions for you. But it's almost never in B2B where you can truthfully like automate a decision fully and and know that you're really making a huge impact into something you're doing. It's it's hard work and you got to go off your gut a lot, I find, which is frustrating because it's not what like the internet at large wants you to believe about marketing. Uh, certainly modern digital marketing, right? It feels like where's you go my, read a bunch of articles. money machine? Yeah. Right. Where, where's the <laughs> dial I get to turn to do my job, right? But it doesn't work that way. So we had... Um Earlier today, as we record this, we did. I did a LinkedIn Live with Frank Cespedes, and he's a lecturer at Harvard uh, Business School, and he wrote a book about sales management earlier this year. And we were talking about this increasingly digital world and how even if it's more digital, how do we put human into the digital? And he said, well, let me, let me challenge you on the increasingly digital. So increasingly, guess. But he said, if you go and ask someone, like just, you know, what percent of, of, of purchases just generally in the world – are done online and we're including Amazon. We're including everything you can do online pre pandemic. What do you guys think that number would be? What percent of purchases are online? 15. Oh, really? I was going to, I was going to go higher. Probably really low. 55. Yeah. I was going to, I mean, I was, um, I was with you. I was going to go something like increase 35, 40 pre pandemic. It was 11%. At the height of the pandemic, it got to 15 and it's been going back down. So he says, like he said, you know, you you can argue about methodology and data all you want. Yeah. But if if this is generally true, the majority of our purchasers, the vast majority are still having offline. Mm -hmm. He says, says, we are not in a digital eat retail world. We're in an omni-channel world. Hmm. And this numbers will continue, I think, to creep up. But the fact that it's still in the teens was interesting to me. Um, and I think that, you know, there's like, oh yeah, we can, we can sell enterprise, enterprise products online. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, sure. People will research, but like, I think, you know, if, 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 if we're using AI to try to approximate real people, real human connections, this is telling me that the buyer still wants to talk to a human. The buyer still wants to be validated by having a human interaction. So AI intent data, like giving us better insights to have more relevant conversations, right? I don't Mm -hmm. need to send 10,000 direct mail pieces this week. I should send 18 (laughs) because these 18 recipients are in exactly the right place to receive that information correctly. Like that's the best use of data. Like I think even as we grow our business, like we're 13 years in, we finally just this year hired our first biz dev person. Like I think a lot about not just like how many dials is she making and how many, I don't care about her activity (laughs) volume. I want to say, how do I maximize her time? How do I make sure she is engaging with accounts and leads at exactly the right time? Like I've got digital tools that can nurture and score people, you know, and get them at direct access, ungated to the information they want. When is the time when they need a human to talk to? Mm-hmm. Um, and and that, I think that that optimization to leverage the human connection at exactly the right place at the right time in the buying journey, that's that's a place I think we all need to be focused on getting to. Well, and I think it's more important with B2B because you're dealing with lower volume, higher value uh, uh, use cases or, yep. or deals, I guess we should call them. Yep. Um, so like we said, that squishiness isn't going to go away. But then inside of that squishiness, you have this thing that's sort of like, I'm resisting falling down the community rabbit hole like I like to do right now. Because, you know, I mean, ultimately, yeah, we're here to talk about data-driven marketing, but the reality is it hits a point where you're still ultimately the people like marketing and sales are both the ones talking to the customers. Right. And, and, and some of that, the cool thing, some of those tools aren't about data in the way that you think 
traditionally, I think, because like you're saying, there's starting to be tools that don't matter for the consumer side as much because you can just overwhelm the need for signal there with volume, mm-hmm. right? I hit 5 million people with that ad. I'm going to have a pretty good understanding of whether or not that copy worked. Um, if my subset is way tinier and way more niche, then you're so low now that it's like, I, yeah, I can tell you yeah. that copy was good, but only to within 10%. And so the tests you end up running instead are mm-hmm. more like, um, or, you know, let's send t-shirts to everyone we have a sales call with for a year and see if they, you know, if our close rate is higher or something, <laughs> you know, it's like stuff that, and it starts to be not like a little less marketing and a little more, how do you make people feel good about Maybe. your brand in a way that, <laughs> again, it's nothing new. It's just that we all have to do it now. Like, like everyone out there can and, and should, I think, think of their brand more like Nike than, than sort of traditionally small businesses have been able to because you can do your own media you can have a podcast you can have a personality you can 100%. create a world where maybe people aren't even using your shoes because they're the best they're just cool <laughs> you know yeah and it's there's there's a brand play there that you know if you're nike right. if you're a cpg company you're certainly playing on but you bring up something else that is about um you know how do you move your marketing from being interruptive to being irresistible Like, how do you create a marketing that people enthusiastically want to receive and engage with? Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you create, how how do you create a channel so that you're no longer renting attention from other people that have it, but you're earning and owning it yourself? I mean, like podcast content channels, I mean, the, 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 everybody can create a content channel. Now that may not generate pipeline for you next month. It's going to take time and effort to sort of build that community. But I mean, just, you know, Adam, you mentioned sort of this, you know, the, the CMO community like that, that's taken a long time to sort of build up. But if you have a community of, of your prospective customers that want to spend time with you, they can't wait for Friday morning so they can get another call with their peers and talk about the latest and greatest of whatever. I mean, not only is that invaluable to you as a brand, but also it is competitively impossible to replace. Mm-hmm. Like I could, you could give a competitor a list of all the people that are in that community, but they could not <laughs> recreate the community. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, it, it ends up being an attention economy thing. Like I only have so much time to do things with. Mm-hmm. And if there's a community that I'm consistently getting value out of for an hour a week, uh, you got that hour. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's unvarnished time to have access to, 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 you know, ideally the people that you're talking about, it's just, anyway, this is the, the community rabbit hole I could talk about forever. Cause it's really <laughs> tricky. Yeah. And I spent oh, yeah. the last year working in uh, open source stuff with like blockchain and it's all like everything I was working on was fully community driven. Right. So like people are busy going product led growth is amazing. Wait till they discover community led growth. Cause it's a completely different thing. You don't even have to make up your features. You just go and you ask your 5,000 true fans. Hey, what do you want us to build? And they go this, and then you go cool and you build it, and, you know, and then they yell at you the whole time. If it's <laughs> they troll you the whole time, if it's not what they actually <laughs> wanted. Um, it's hilarious. But no, the, uh, so I'd like to kind of jump back to talking about the, uh, cooperation between the departments and sort of, you know, I'm curious, like what you think the fundamental struggles that emerge there are, because there's an interesting aspect of like needing to create the communication and an understanding of the extent to which these two sort of formerly separate groups are now working together. At the same time, there are unavoidable conflicts of interest and unavoidable sort of adversarial relationships you know, like sales is always going to blame marketing for bad leads and marketing is going to always blame sales for not closing the leads. <laughs> and it's just kind of never going to go away because humans get in the system and then they human about it all, you know, <laughs> like, so that's a part of it. But then, you know, it gets a little more practical also because you look at the top and budget allocation and everybody is in the end fighting for money so they can continue to survive as a department, you know, like that, that that aspect of the tension is kind of never going to go away. So like, how do you build trust, I guess, between them? A couple of ways. Um, I mean, I, I, my, my history is coming from the marketing side and I feel comfortable saying like a lot of this alignment challenge is marketing's fault hmm. because we have come to the table all of a sudden where, you know, so we show up one day and say, 
we should be revenue responsible too. We should have <laughs> the same definitions. And market sales is going there. Well, thank you for, you know, I mean, I literally, this couple of years ago had a company that they could, they didn't understand, CMO didn't understand why sales didn't trust them. And it was like the last day of the month or it was the last week of the quarter or something like that. And sales, you know, they're grinding it out, trying to like finish the quarter strong, trying to get those last couple of deals across the, across the line. And I was meeting with the CMO and they're like, hey, we really need to work on a relationship. I need to figure out how to get sales to trust us. And he says, oh, I got to go. He said, oh, so where are you going? He says, well, we're the whole marketing team. We're going down to the bar to celebrate that we hit our retweet goal for the month. I'm like, <laughs> that might be part of the problem. <laughs> that your sales team is grinding it out and you guys are celebrating a metric that I mean, it, it may, this may very well be optics. I don't mean to poo-poo retweets, right? Because there's an awful lot of value in sort of build, as we we're talking about, building a community, building an audience, driving engagement. Mm -hmm. Those are building blocks for the business. But if as marketers, you think you're done when you got your retweet goal, what I would rather see is if there's a deal that's going to make or break your quarter and there's one member of the buying committee that isn't quite bought off yet. And if there's a piece of content that would help them reduce that obstacle so they would sign and say yes, would your marketing team be willing to get into that war room with sales and create content for an audience of one? <laughs> the most efficient metric that volume based marketers can think of is one. <laughs> but like if that one piece of content compelled that deal to close, wouldn't that be one of the most valuable things you could do that week? So I think that there's a there's a there's a historical perspective that sales brings that says marketing is not a partner. You're not gonna you're not gonna solve that with one act. You're gonna solve that with a body of work. Um, and the other thing that I think is getting in the way of this is, is who gets credit, the attribution issue. Was this a sales generated deal or was this a marketing generated deal? And the fact of the matter in complex selling situations, yes to all, <laughs> right? It's going to be a bunch of great content. It's going to be a bunch of good marketing. It's going to be a bunch of great selling. This is a team sport. Right. Like the best teams in the world, I think about sporting sporting, you know, sports teams like it's not a they may have a couple superstars, but it's a team effort. Like Matt Hasselback, we're here in Seattle. Matt Hasselback was inducted into the, the ring of honor for the Seahawks yesterday. And like he's the guy who's going to have his name and number on the stadium. But in his speech, he said, like, this is for everybody. My teammates, my coaches, the locker room attendants, like everybody that made it possible for me to be up there. This is a team effort. And selling in complex situations is exactly the same. And so that's the approach you have to take strategically to, to say like, yeah, we need to know what's working and what's not. But if we forget about credit and simply think about like, how do we get these deals across the line? Now we can start to do the things together that can build that trust and rapport long term to make that relationship work. Another great answer to a complex question and something that we run into a lot because we've, we've gone through a pretty crazy transformation here as a business internally. Uh, two years ago, we only made fantastically complex sales to big enterprise customers, like huge customers. And over the last two years, we launched a SaaS product and hired a marketing team and started selling like digitally online product led growth. And so that transition for everybody's mindset has been uh, just rapid and challenging and, and completely different space now. And there's what we keep seeing, and you you articulate this really well. It's like the time to having an effect, right? There's a, uh, there's marketing. A lot of the time, I think the marketing team comes into an organization or you're, you're, you're someone you hire to lead the team comes in and says, well, here's my long-term strategy. And a lot of what they do may not do anything functional for the bottom line for years. Mm -hmm. um, but you also they also can't spend all their time just helping to close one deal. And so you end up with a really challenging question of, well, what's the balance? And also we need to really clearly all be articulating, well, this effort's going to take this amount of time to help over this time period. Um, and then how to and calculating that. And again, and when you layer in the data driven part, now you're like, well, this is all too complex to actually run numbers on. So you're back to like making some gut decisions. So I'd say, uh, yeah, it's a lot of, it's a lot more complexity layered, a lot of numbers, a lot of dials to worry about. Well, and it's knowing what you can and can't measure, knowing what's important. I mean, I've, someone told me once, they said there's an inverse correlation between the ease with which you can get to a metric and the importance it has to your business. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So what that tells me is the most important metrics are the ones that are going to be the hardest to actually identify, if not impossible, given the data and the tools that you have. Um, and there's some really smart CMOs and marketing teams and RevOps teams that are doing things around, you know, using Power BI and using some data 
uh, sort of illustration tools to sort of get to sort of some better answers. But it's usually not you usually don't get to the answers. It's kind of like watching um, like a damn. It's kind of like reading a damn Brown novel or watching if anyone was watching <laughs> the Lost Symbol on Peacock. It's like they keep finding another clue and it's not the answer. It's a clue <laughs> with X clue. Right. But you're getting closer and you're learning along the way and you're getting smarter about how to make decisions. Yeah, because the data isn't gonna isn't gonna close business for you. The data and insights you're looking for are gonna help you make better decisions about what mm-hmm. to do next. And it's okay to sometimes say what I've seen is not a perfect complete picture, but it's helping me make better decisions. It's increasing my conversion and win rate on those new ideas. Yeah, because they're more educated and informed now. So, what do you see <clears throat> as the right? things for these teams to coalesce around and i say things because i think a lot of the time people want to throw a metric out like let's coalesce around i don't know cost per lead or days to close right i think there's a lot more for these teams to coordinate around it's not just a number there probably are some numbers that are relevant um it's also like meeting styles or coordination methods or communication styles is there like a process or a or a handful of things that you would say to a team that's really trying to work hard on on bridging these gaps and coordinating these teams, what do they start with? Definitions and economics. Hmm. So definitions meaning like what is our addressable market and who are the best prospects for us within that addressable market? What's your ideal customer profile? Yep. More definitions. Who are the people within those organizations? Mm-hmm. What roles do they play as part of the buying committee? So if I'm saying, if I sit here and say right company, right person at that company, like we can get to like what to say to them later, but we have to start with what companies do we want to sell to and who are the yeah. people that we're willing to engage with those companies. More definitions. What does it mean to be a lead that's worth sales following up with? Like I don't I honestly, I don't even th- think that much about MQLs anymore, like marketing qualified leads, the way mostly th- they're defined in most organizations, like it's a vanity metric. Mm-hmm. When I've got a person at a company that is ready for a sales interaction, what does that mean? What is that definition? Mm-hmm. And it's going to be different for different companies. But number those those are some of the definitions I want to have in place. And the second is the economics. What is it worth to ge- what is it worth for us to generate a qualified opportunity from someone in that ICP? Mm-hmm. What is it worth for us to get that closed business? And there's a reason you got to think about the economics of this. One is like I don't want to argue about like, you know, three extra cents on the cost per (laughs) click on a marketing campaign. I want to know that I'm willing to spend up to a certain amount to acquire a client. And also in a PLG motion or in a, in a, in a land and expand motion, you may, your closed deal, your closed one may be a fraction of the value of that prospect. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we were talking earlier about sort of not the sales funnel, but the revenue bow tie, like you got a deal that could be worth a hundred thousand a year and you just closed $2,000 in revenue that ain't close one. That's a sales stage. My friend, that <laughs> might be your sales qualified lead. I'm That's serious. Right. Like I've seen some yeah, companies are starting to look at getting a free trial or getting a freemium or sort of doing the initial purchase. That's the SQL. Yeah. Huh? It's not a closed one until you achieve X percent of the deals potential value. Right. So thinking about like, what are we defining as success? What do the economics look like in terms of those different stages and what they're worth to us? And this may be a conversation you got to get your CFO to come in. I, I can tell you how many CMOs go to the CFO and say like, like, what are you willing to spend to acquire a customer that's going to give us this much lifetime value or this much in first year? And, the, and, and what about enterprise versus mid market? Like what's, you know, wh- how do you think about the model? Like CFOs are like, you're in marketing, you're asking this question. Like, first of all, that's amazing. Let's keep talking. Right. <laughs> so again, like the, the, the definitions and economics can go a long ways towards creating the foundation for operational alignment moving forward. Mm-hmm. The, what I heard from your previous answer was also, you should not celebrate the wrong metrics <laughs> <laughs> outwardly. Um, yeah. I mean, it's important to celebrate among your team. I don't mean don't go to the bar. Just don't let sales know that you went to the bar because you got 10,000 retreats. <laughs> um, look, I, I, it's it's okay. <laughs> I mean, marketing can celebrate higher click rates and retweets and impressions. Because, I mean, like I said, these are all building blocks. It's no different than sales saying, like, hey, congrats. Like, you know, you made 100 dials yesterday. Or congrats. Like, hey, BDR team, you mm-hmm. set 40 appointments this week. It's like... 
40 appointments is the sales version of I got a bunch of white paper downloads. Like <laughs> those yeah. may or may not be valuable if they're for the right people, then fine. But you can't buy a beer with any of those metrics. <laughs> so there are building blocks to marketing. There are building blocks of sales that are important. I guess it's like, what is the means? What is the ends? And making sure that you're really clear on what those differences are uh, is critical to making this work. And I'll say the last thing before we bring this thing in for a landing uh, to your point about how marketers don't like to make uh, one one to one content, essentially, uh, that's that's one that I always push back on with the marketers that I talk to because I understand how they feel that way, but that doesn't strike me as like the appropriate digital perspective because if you can use that one to one conversation to make a template, then you never have to have it again. Right? <laughs> Just think of it that way. And you're just, you're just always creating, I mean, it's, there's content, but then there's the template for the content. If you can create a template instead of the content, then you just, you're building algorithms now instead of just thinking about like another, another deck, (sighs) you know? (laughs) Yeah. This brings me back to something again that I keep seeing. And this is partly because I'm coming at a lot of this from the engineering perspective, but I, I more and more think of a modern marketing team as the engineering team for the sales team. Right, they look at the projects that are happening, look at the things that are being done repetitively, and start to automate them. Right, like extract conversations and turn it into content. Right, extract processes and put it inside software. And it's not so much that marketing is eating sales; it's that marketing is consuming and automating the annoying things and opening up these salespeople who usually are in that role because they're fantastic at socializing. Right, they love talking to people and and uncovering ideas in a social setting, and they get energy from that that work it's enabling them to do what they like more, right? Instead of all the tedious stuff. Um, so that, that dynamic uh, works so well, I think, when you start to see, hey, how are we helping each other? How are we making each other's jobs more interesting and, and have more fun day to day? The team wins and loses together. Mm-hmm. But people on that team are going to have different roles, right? Like you're not, you know, if, if all of a sudden you need a base hit to drive in a run at in the bottom of the ninth, you're probably not going to bring in a relief pitcher to, 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 <laughs> to, to, to hit. Right. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, you've got different roles in different people on the team. And so I, I don't, I mean, in the future, like, you know, are we still going to have a marketing department and a sales department? I think so. It does just because we're asking them to work together more closely. It doesn't mean you don't have specialized skills. Um, but, but I think it's important to realize that, you know, to your point, your the, the, your sales team should not be prospecting. Your sales team should not be having to create their own bespoke content on their own individually, right? There are things that I think if your if your marketing team is the voice of the customer, understands the buying journey, and can use these the data we have, use the insights, use the int- use the um, incent- in- intent data to bring sales fewer leads, but educated, motivated, ready to, to engage leads. Like that's what sales wants. Let, and then let sales work their magic mm-hmm. with your continued guidance from a content process and system standpoint. Um, it's not, yeah, it's not a marketing eight sales. This you, we need each other mm-hmm. to be successful on, in a predictable way moving forward. Love it. That feels like a pretty good place to wrap up. <laughs> Great uh, summary. It's been, yeah. This, uh, <laughs> thanks for thanks for joining us, Matt. This is great. My great pleasure. This is fun. Um, where can people find you? Around uh, the interwebs. Uh, on the on the interwebs, uh, just Heinz Marketing, H E I N Z, like the ketchup marketing dot com. We got a ton of great content. We got a bunch of research. Um, so check that out. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, my email is Matt M A T T at Heinz Marketing dot com. Would look forward to hearing from anybody. Awesome. Awesome. And you can find us on Twitter at data driven pod. It's probably the best rabbit hole to start down. Otherwise, uh, this has been another episode of the data driven marketer. I'm Adam. I'm Brian. I'm Matt. Take it easy, everybody. 